Right, okay. So, and thank you very much for uh, this wonderful t um, conference here. And uh, it's my first time uh, to attend this um, uh, meeting here, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, and say so I'd like to talk some of the work that we have done in the um, basically biosensing or biodiagnostic areas, and uh, I'm from um, School of Chemistry and also the Asbury Center based and uh, University of Leeds in the UK. Oh, okay, so is that, where is the other? Oh. No, no. Um, right, so of course, um, in terms of diagnosis or so the current health care challenges, and it goes without saying, cancer is one of those uh, major heater here. Uh, and of course, uh, each year, over 8 million people were uh, died of can uh, from cancer, and uh, even with the global effort here, then the cancer deaths is uh, actually predicting to increase, of course. Uh, one of the major um, strategy that we might be able to do is to be able to diagnose cancer early. Oh. Uh, in that case, um, uh, we really need to, to be able to push um, the sensitivity of our diagnostic, cancer, uh, diagnostic assays here. And uh, here is um, a very good example here. Uh, if you can really improve your sensitivity here, then that do allow you to be able to diagnose this cancer um, uh, much early. And of course, uh, what kind of gold standard here uh, when we're talking about for cancer diagnosis? Uh, many of those cancer diagnoses these days uh, are still based on the so-called ELISA answers. Uh, so is that all the audience know what the ELISA is uh, really about? Or if so, then I will. Uh, not talk about too much about it. And uh, effectively, what you will is um, you have to you, uh, have your basically capture antibody to capture your target, and then you sandwich your target, and then you introduce the signal antibody with the enzyme tagged, and then you, after watching anything away unbound, then, then you do the uh, enzymatic assays. Um, but of course, uh, as, well, as far as we see here, um, there are quite a few limitations um, to what you might be able to achieve for ELISA here. First, of course, um, how are you going to be able to Im uh, immobilize all of your antibodies uh, in the right kind of format? Typically, you only get about 5 to 10 percent of them are really in the right format. Uh, and of course, uh, when you have the enzymes uh, immobilized on the surfaces, then their activity is no longer as active as free enzymes and uh, typically you lose significant activities. And also because uh, in each step here, we do need to do a number of washings. So uh, how strong your antibody antigen binding here is going to be quite important. And of course, uh, you have to use a surface immobilized antibodies to capture your target here. So it's a really slow process. And as a result, the total assays um, typically take you quite, uh, quite long uh, up to, yeah, sometimes overnight. And um, because of these limitations, uh, what kind of uh, sensitivity ELISA can, tell, uh, can do is typically on the nanomolar to picomolar kind of range. So it may limit, oh, um, why am, oh, um, it may limit uh, basically the potential how you might be able to diagnose cancer. Here I gave you a very good um, uh, example here. If you see a very, very early stages of cancer, um, about one millimeter cube, then that's typically contains about oh, a million cells, and these are actually below the limit to what MRI can tell you about. So effectively, uh, you, you may not be able to image it currently. Um, and if you assume each of them gave you 5,000 um, biomarkers, and then uh, the blood marker concentration here, we are talking about is two fentanyl. So effectively, the sensitivity here is uh, actually two, three orders um, below what you can detect by ELISA here. So uh, what my group has been working on is uh, actually we uh, combine with uh, different nanomaterials uh, with biomolecules, and then we do specific uh, conjugation and um, by conjugation chemistry. So we can control uh, the valency and also the presentation of your biomolecules on the surfaces, so it can maximize its binding through the multivalent binding effect. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, we can create a multivalent nanoparticle 
that allow you to be able to do a number of different things. One, of course, uh, we can use them for diagnosis. We can also use it for multifunctional um, nanomedicine, and uh, we can also use it as a nanoprobe to probe multivalent protein ligand interactions. Um, yeah, in terms of the uh, biosensing part, um, we, um, our early work uh, have been found that if we have the enzyme, instead of immobilizing surfaces, if you immobilize them onto really tiny magnetic particles, actually uh, the activity of the enzyme can be retained as a free enzyme and, uh, uh, at the same level of your free enzymes. And also for these tiny uh, magnetic particles, then actually they have these so-called uh, super magnetic property, which means uh, it does not have any magnetic resistance. Uh, this also means uh, in the absence of the maglet, you get uh, a uniform uh, uh, dispersions, um, but it can still be rapidly collected. So this makes them extremely efficient for rapid capture and then to retain high enzyme activity here. So based on this, uh, uh, we have developed the so-called um, enzyme uh, magnetic part, uh, particle sandwich assays. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, we have um, the capture and uh, DNA basically attached to the magnetic particle, and then our signal DNA is attached to an enzyme. And the sandwich bind to your DNA target, and then you form the sandwich. After washing away anything bound, then you can do the enzymatic assays. Um, because here, uh, your magnetic particle can offer really rapid capture, and also the enzyme activity is high, then we uh, think this should be a way to be able to improve the sensitivity here. And uh, it does, and uh, even with uh, the calorimetric sensing, with one hour amplification, we can easily get to almost uh, no picomolar kind of sensitivities. Um, and the bending here, it's uh, actually not, um, uh, it's uh, due to basically we haven't added enough of the enzyme substrate, so it's um, basically most of the enzyme has been um, turned over here, but we do have a good calibration curve and also very high signal to background ratios. And if you extend the enzymatic complication time to overnight, then effectively 100 fundamolar, it's uh, readily achievable. Uh, and also our sensor, it's uh, robust. You can work in 10% human serum, so it's um, biologically uh, relevant kind of conditions. Uh, instead of using color metric, if I use um, uh, fluor metric, then that gives you a high sensitivity because fluorescence is more sensitive than color metric. So as a result, even with 40 minutes amplification time, we can really achieve uh, almost um, yeah, 10 femtomolar kind of sensitivities. Um, uh, it's really achievable. Uh, of course, uh, not only can we just uh, simply just convert each capture target into just one enzyme, uh, we can use uh, a polymer beads that is tagged with um, several thousand enzymes. As a result, the sensitivity here is dramatically improved. Uh, for example here, uh, if you see 10 atomola, it's now readily detected. But of course, uh, uh, sensitivity is uh, one thing. Uh, how specific uh, your sensors are, that uh, is actually very important, especially in terms of if you want to detect a very, very tiny fraction uh, of those uh, mutated cancer genes in the background of your white type um, genes, then you have to be really uh, very, very specific. In this case, uh, we have developed the so-called target recycle ligation here. Uh, we have a phosphate probe and a biotin probe, and of course, uh, uh, the sandwich bind. You, uh, when the target and the probes are perfect match, then um, basically the ligase, covalent ligase, uh, if there's um, a single base mutation here, or the mismatch here, then it's not gonna cause the ligation. So, uh, of course, uh, we can do the certain a number of temperate cycles, and uh, each cycle gives you a ligated um, product. So in that case, uh, after cycles, then you get the accumulated um, accumulation of those ligated product. And afterwards, we can use a magnet particle with the capture DNA to basically capture those uh, ligated product and then do the enzymatic assays. Uh, and as a result, you can see actually the uh, specificity here is um, much higher. Here it's on the perfect match target uh, signal complications, and uh, all these are different um, mismatches. Uh, in fact, all, uh, we have tried all 16 different ATCG combinations, 
And in each case, uh, only those um, perfect match in a target and probe give you the high signal and um, all other mismatches uh, give you a much lower background. And um, in this case, uh, you can see that's on the background here. Uh, our signal to background ratio is over 150. And the discrimination ratio here by just uh, a single base mutation here can be greater than 120 fold. Uh, and also we have tested and this sensor does work if you have a small fraction of your cancer uh, mutated genes uh, in the background Y type target, then uh, we do have a good calibration curve here. Uh, effectively, we can detect um, basically less than 1%, which means uh, you, you only have one copy of your cancer uh, mutant in the presence of your Y type target. We can detect it. Uh, and uh, this kind of specificity is uh, actually better than uh, the leg generation sequencing which can typically uh, detect about 1%, that kind of levels. Right, so here is a, a summary slide to see how our sensors compare to others. Um, in terms of the sensitivity, uh, we are comparable to most uh, other sensors uh, and also uh, the detection limit stuff. Um, we are among the best uh, as reported in the literature and of course, uh, all these uh, we have done is uh, on synthetic gene target. The next step uh, is going to move to the clinical samples, um, especially we hope to be able to detect um, basically cancer mutant in their clinic samples. Um, okay, so finally, I'd like to basically thank the, uh, my student and poster who did uh, the work, basically Yue Zhang uh, and uh, Yuan Gu. Uh, she yeah, they, they did most of the work here and uh, the fundings oh, okay. from uh, these guys over the years. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. Is there any question from the audience? Uh, maybe can you uh, discuss a little bit the direct relationship between your research you presented and the cancer treatment uh, or detection you have in mind? Um, yeah, well, one of the things here, of course, um, how can we really uh, develop those um, non-invasive diagnoses? And uh, uh, if we can detect uh, very, very tiny fractions of the cancer mutations um, in the circulation blood, for example, then that can be used to monitoring how the patient responds on two different treatment and uh, under what kind of levels um, we're going to be able to, yeah. For example, if the patients go for chemotherapies or what kind of treatment, then we can follow the blood basically circulation DNAs that is uh, specifically related to the cancer mutant and then it can be used as a rapid monitoring way to be able to improve the patient outcome here. Is there any other question from the audience? Uh, please use the microphone. Just a remark about markers in uh, cancer. Uh, you gave an example of PSA at the beginning of your lecture. And I want to make you aware that PSA is no more used today because in the last literature you can find out that even uh, normal, so-called normal levels of PSA, they had cases of cancer which was very advanced. Which means, again, I want to show you the sensitivity and the correlation with the disease. It should be that it, it, there are some, some disease of cancer that it's very hard to stabilize the normal. And uh, this is also a problem of markers, is my remark. So anyhow, PSA is no more used in many centers because it doesn't give you any uh, prediction, okay? Um, yeah, I do understand, basically. Uh, PSA is uh, not the perfect marker for um, prostate-specific cancer. It um, probably gave you about 50, 60% kind of diagnosis, and uh, that's why we are moving to the genetic-based mutations. Um, actually, uh, genes uh, give you a much higher, basically, diagnosis um, accuracy here, and. Uh, uh, I'm actually collaborating with one of the cancer clinicians, and he's uh, the expert in the um, cancer gene mutation diagnosis, and uh, w we are working towards that goal there.
Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And the next talk is also related to cancer and uh, Professor